All right, so I have that as two o'clock, so let's get to it. Um, just a quick recap of what we talked about on Monday. We were looking at DNA sequencing. Um, we talked about the old method, and that's still used, the chain terminator sequencing method, and now the newer next-gen sequencing methods. Uh, we talked about how pyro sequencing works and how Illumina works. The next thing I wanna talk about, and I have it as a question, but we're really not gonna do it as a question, is how we actually take what we get from these next gen sequences and make sense of it. Remember what we're doing in those next gen sequencing is just sequencing strands of like 100 to 200 nucleotides at a time, right? So we figure out, you know, for 100 to 200 nucleotides, what's the sequence? But we're trying to sequence an organism that might have, you know, a certain billion number of uh, nucleotides. So how does this actually work in practice? What you do to recombine these fragments into an actual like organism is that you, when you break up the DNA, you do it in such a way that there's overlap. And this is kind of done just by breaking up the DNA randomly. If you break up the DNA randomly, you break up many copies of the DNA, you're gonna have overlap. And so you break up the DNA, you sequence these fragments, and then you have to put the fragments back together like a puzzle. And you're looking for overlapping sequences. So here in the middle, I have what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sequences of DNA that came from the same organism that I've sequenced. And my question is, what is the overall sequence? What is overall sequence? And what is done is that you just take these sequences and you try to find areas of overlapping. So for an example, I'm gonna take uh, the first sequence, TCG, C, A, C, G, and then write it out. Then in the next sequence, I'm going to look to see if there's any areas that overlap. And there is. You see this sequence also has T, C, G. So I'm going to try and fit that together. So it goes A, T, T, A, T, C, G, right? Now sequence three, is there any overlap with sequence three with the two sequences I have lined up so far? There is, um, we have CACG and CACG. So I'm gonna line that up as well. CACG, TCC. Then you just move on. So the fourth one, is there any overlap there? Yeah, TCC, even a, C, G, so A, C, G, uh, T, C, C, A. Then fragment number five, do I have any overlap? So on and so forth. And what you do is you just see how everything overlaps to get a complete sequence. So I'm not gonna do five, six, seven, and eight. They actually do work out, but you just look, if we just take the four sequences I've done so far, you would say, okay, the overall sequence of this organism, and all I'm doing is I'm looking at what we have. So A, T, T, A, T, C, G, C, A, C, G. So C, A, C, G, T, C, C, A. And that's how you can use this high throughput sequencing um, to uh, sequence a whole organism's DNA super fast. Now, there's not actually somebody who does this. Like, you don't give somebody like a million different reads of DNA and say, put this together for us. Um, this is an easy problem for a computer to fix. Like, computers can do that, uh, no problem. So, something that would take me like three minutes to do, uh, a computer would do it in like a second. But that, that whole idea is how we put the genome back together. So is there any questions about that method 
or any questions about high throughput sequencing from Monday or anything at all. All right, if not, we can uh, continue on with our discussion of DNA or nucleotides in general, I should say. So we have sequenced the entire human genome. Um, and like I said, we can do it at such a rate right now that it takes 24 hours and about $1,000 to sequence one entire human. And by doing this sequencing, we found some very interesting things. So one thing we found is that if you take two random humans and you look at their DNA, the difference between humans in general is one in 1,000 nucleotides. In one sec, I have my little doggy scratching on the door to get out, so I'm going to let her out before she barks. All right, so you take any two humans in the world and you just compare their genomes. You're different about one in every thousand nucleotides saying that humans are 99.9% .9 the same, which I mean, isn't that big of a shock since we're the same organism, but you know, it could be a, a shock the first time you hear it just cause you see how much diversity there is between humans. And it's down to very few DNA. Even when you look at humans and chimpanzees, you're looking at like a 1% difference. So um, again, little DNA can make a huge difference. Here's two different types of corn. Again, you're looking at just a uh, tenth of percentage change to go from wild corn, which is this little thing, to corn we have now um, that, we, that we eat. Looking at the actual human genome, um, uh, some interesting things were definitely found doing this project. Uh, to me, the most shocking thing is that proteins only make up, you know, 1.2 to 1.5% of all of our DNA. And I say that's shocking because proteins do more or less everything in our body. Um, they, it's what keeps us alive. Um, it's what does all the biochemistry, like majority of it is proteins. Yet only 1.5% of our genome is uh, for proteins. And you can compare this to um, other organisms, like less complex organisms. And what you'll find is that in some cases, the amount of proteins in us is lower than the amount of proteins in like maybe a yeast or something like that, or a bacteria, percentage wise that is. Um, and the reason is, is that eukaryotic proteins are just much more complex than prokaryotic proteins. Um, you've probably learned some of this already where you have uh, introns and extrons and based on how you splice things together, you get different proteins, right? Prokaryotes can't do that. Eukaryotes can do that. So that's what makes us more complex. Looking at the proteins even more in depth, you can see that humans aren't that unique. Like the vast majority, over 90% of the proteins, and it might even be higher than 90%. I forget the exact percentage, but the proteins found in us is found in all life, right? So we're not really that unique when it comes to you know different proteins. Also, what is interesting is that over 50% of our DNA is just made out of some sort of repeating sequences. Um, and it's just various repeating sequences. Your DNA is just repeat, 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 repeat. Um, you can kind of see that like long repeating sequences here, uh, simple uh, repeating sequences. Uh, transposons are just things that can um, move around in your DNA. We might talk a little bit about transposons if we have time this semester. Um, but looking at the um, proton, uh, protein coding gene, so if we look at this 5% and 
and we just kind of zoom in on it. Another thing that's shocking to me is that 37% of protein coding genes, we have no idea what it does. Like, why is that there? And I should just say, we are defining a, pro a protein coding gene by saying it has an open reading frame. And as we study more about DNA and organisms, the protein coding genes could change the amount as we better understand exactly where proteins start and stop. But looking at what we have now, um, you know, 37% unknown. Uh, the other than the unknown sequence, uh, enzymes are, are the most uh, prevalent, which makes sense. Enzymes do the chemistry. So it would make sense that we have a lot of those. And then you can just break it down from there. Um, some other interesting thing about when you look at the genome, it's full of like virus DNA because we've been being infected by viruses for just as long as we've been alive. So, and, and humans have actually, and mammals in general, I should say, have actually taken advantage of some of those viral proteins. Like uh, the placenta is actually just a virus, virus capsid protein that's in our DNA that over time has evolved into the placenta. But originally it was a virus capsid protein that just kind of wound its way into the DNA. Now looking at this, um, I don't expect you to like remember like all their percentages, um, maybe like the proton protein coding genes. No, that's like less than 2%. If you have that down, uh, that's good. Good for me. Uh, a lot of it's just repeating DNA that that's fine, but I'm not going to have you memorize any like of these hardcore numbers. I'm not that interested in that. Um, yeah, and I do have a question over here about gene density. I think I'm gonna skip that for the sake of time. It's just how to calculate, you know, how many, what is the average spacing of uh, proteins in a DNA? Um, so I'm, I'm gonna skip that for now. But is there any questions anybody has about, you know, human DNA, uh, the genome project, uh, the different percentages, uh, anything like that? Okay, if not, um, we can move on to today's PowerPoint. That was the end of Mondays. So let's switch then to today's. And today's topic, as you can already see, is we're gonna talk about how to manipulate DNA now. So we just, on the Monday and Friday, we talked about the characteristics of DNA Let's see how biochemists can use DNA to do different things in the laboratory. And when we talk to manipulating DNA, there's basically four steps that we'll go into detail. Um, and when I talk about manipulating DNA, I'm talking about uh, molecular cloning or genetic engineering, you know, GMOs or recombinant DNA technology. All of those keywords mean the same. And if you ever see like GMO, all that means is that it has recombinant DNA, it has DNA that humans put in there um, to do something different. So there's four different steps to really manipulating DNA. One, you need uh, DNA of appropriate size to input into a new organism. And you can either get this DNA by PCR, restriction endonucleases, or you can make it in a lab. So I need DNA to put into an organism. That's step one, makes sense. Step two, I need some carrier to put my DNA in. So the idea here is I'm taking DNA and I'm putting it into an organism. Well, how am I gonna put it into that organism? That thing is called a vector. So I'm gonna get a vector, put my DNA into the vector and then put my vector into the organism. And that's actually step three, putting my vector into the organism. Then step four 
is I'm gonna take the cells that have my DNA and I'm gonna select those and discard the cells that don't have my DNA. And we're gonna talk about all four steps in depth of how we can systematically uh, in a laboratory setting manipulate DNA. So the first thing we're going to look at is our vector, right? Also known as a plasmid. So I want to put my DNA into another organism. The vehicle I'm going to use is called a plasmid or a vector. So I have some questions here and I, I will actually just go through and answer um, A for us to begin with. What makes a good plasma? Like, what are some good characteristics if I'm looking for a plasma to um, insert into an organism? So one characteristic is that it multiplies on its own. So self-replicating. So the idea with these plasmids is that I want to grow some protein. Therefore, I want a lot of copies of my protein DNA in my cell. So it would be really great if my plasmid would multiply at a rate that's faster than the organism. So I can have thousands of copies of my plasmid inside the organism. So that would be great if we could do that. It needs a, what is called a selectable marker. And there's been confusion with this in previous classes. What is a selectable marker? So let's take a look over at our plasmid to the left. You can see here on the plasmid, there's something called AMP-R. This stands for ampicillin resistance. Ampicillin is a, a chemical that can kill bacteria, so an antibacterial uh, molecule. The idea here is if I have a bunch of cells, right, and I'm trying to put my plasmid into the cells, I need to know which cells have successfully gotten my plasmid. So after attempting to put my plasma into the cells, I'm going to put them on a plate that is covered with ampicillin. Any cell that does not have my plasmid will be killed by ampicillin. And they will not live on my plate. The cells that did receive my plasmid now have gained ampicillin resistance and so they will live. So that is what a selectable marker is. It's a way on my plasmid to determine if a cell has my plasmid. So it can be antibacterial resistance. There's another one called blue-white screening that we'll talk about briefly, but it just needs some way that I can determine my plasmid would put into the cell. It also needs restriction sites, restriction enzyme sites. So the idea here is I'm putting foreign DNA into the plasmid. And to do that, I need to be able to cut open my plasmid. And so I need a lot of restriction enzyme sites. If you look at a real plasmid used for um, molecular cloning, and PUC18 is one, stands for Plasmid University of California number 18. So it's the 18th one they've come up with. You'll see that there's like one site that just has a lot of restriction enzymes, like sequences all put together. That's kind of saying you should put your um, enzyme here or, or your DNA here rather. And lastly, size. Uh, it has to be usually lower than 10 kilobase pairs. So smaller than 10,000 uh, base pairs. And the reason for that is we're shoving this into a cell. So 
if the plasma is too big, it won't go in. So those, those are the factors that usually make it good for cloning. When you're looking to see where should I put my, my uh, DNA into, which restriction enzyme should I use? Again, and so I'm answering B. Again, you wanna look for the area that has a lot of them in a row. That's telling you it should go here. What you do not wanna do ever, you never wanna put it in your selectable marker because if you put your protein there, you have just lost ampicillin resistance and any cell that got your plasma would now die. Um, and also you wanna try to um, avoid like places that might not be turned on by your operon. Here we use the LAC system. A lot of plasmids use the LAC, LAC system. Um, but mainly keep it away from your selectable marker and see if there's a site on your plasmid that has a lot of restriction enzymes uh, right next to each other. So is there any questions about A or B um, before we discuss point C here? All right, so the last thing I, I'm just interested to know um, people's, uh, oh, do we have a question? Uh, so then you would want to put in the lax Z. Um, so I think that this um, label is a little not great because it's such a simplified um, image. Generally, you don't want to put it in any LAC areas. Um, so I think the coloring scheme's a little bad here. Um, you will have one area that's just restriction enzyme, restriction enzyme, restriction enzyme, restriction enzyme, and it should come right after your lac operon. So I think that's what they were trying to show there, that it's coming right after the lac operon. So when you add your lactose, um, the plasmid will turn on and create your gene. So you usually want to do it right after the, the lac system, the lac operon system. All right, so C, it's just for, for C, I'm just curious uh, on people's thoughts about this since we're all, uh, we've been through science, everybody here has been through a lot of science now. Um, and it's always interesting for me when I go like to grocery stores and I see the number of anti-GMO products. Um, and to further complicate this, um, so this scientist down, he, down here, I'm, I'm not sure if you heard about this, um, but in 2019, uh, what he did, Chinese scientist, was that he made three GMO babies, um, three that we know of now. Um, I was just looking this up earlier today to see if the story has changed since uh, late 2019, and it hasn't. Um, but yeah, he, he, he um, created three GMO babies um, without telling anybody else in the scientific community, really. He had some minor collaborators, but not all that much. Um, and so he has created the first humans that have been genetically modified by other humans. And as far as I know, I couldn't really find information today. Uh, the, the babies are still healthy, um, still alive. And the idea that he was going for, allegedly, is that he wanted to knock out the gene that HIV uses to invade cells. So he, he says he wanted to make um, babies that are, uh, that can never get HIV AIDS. Um, it's a little skeptical if that's actually the true, the truth, um, because the gene that you also knock out for that has also been linked to intelligence, I believe, if I remember right. So, um, yeah, it, it's, who knows what the truth is there. Um, so he was sentenced to three years in jail 
um, for um, you know, changing human DNA, uh, embryo DNA. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering if anybody had any thoughts on whether it is ethical to create or use a GMO. So I'm just looking for an open discussion here on what people think about that. Um, and if you don't want to share your views publicly, um, you can send me like a private message and I will not uh, give your name away. But I, I'm just wondering if people had thoughts on that. Like, do you think it is ethical to manipulate and use, well, to manipulate the DNA of other organisms, use it for our purposes? You think it could be? Um, can you expand on why you think it could be? Yeah, and there's no right or wrong answer for this. I'm just, I'm just curious. I'd like, I'd like to see discussions on these gray areas of science. So, why do you think it could be? You think it just depends. Depends on what? In cases for chromosome 21 or 12, it may be, uh, they are very high risk, good intentions, better genome material. So I guess let, let, me, let me narrow the question down. Do you think it's ethical? Do you think it's all right to do GMO on like plants and animals? And do you think it's okay to do GMOs or make genetically modified humans? Or do you think making genetically modified humans crosses the line that that's something we should not try to do? No, if it's just because, okay. So I'm guessing that no goes towards humans. I don't think we should be doing GMOs on humans. Other areas could be useful. When it comes to humans, I don't think it's right. But it's there if something's great for the good on the specific future. Um, yeah, I mean, humans is the tricky thing, right? Um, like, it depends on the on if the change of the human gen being uh, detrimental to human health. I don't think it's unethical in humans if it's meant to improve our bodies. All right, so, so a lot of varying viewpoints there, um, which is all good. And because everybody here, um, you know, being biochemistry students, you are on the front line of having to think about these issues. Um, I, I know you're probably not going to go into being a biochemist, um, but you will be hearing about these things for the rest of your life, because it's already happened. The genie is out of the bottle. It happened in 2019. Um, and so as a society, that's something we will have to wrestle with. Do we want to go down the path of GMO humans? I mean, because if like, you can have a lot of like um, thought experiments, like what if I said to you, all right, I actually do I can modify a human 100% accuracy so that they can never get HIV um, and I can eradicate HIV, no problem, if I create a GMO human or something like that. Um, 
of course, doing GMOs, you can never say with 100% that's true. That's, that's one of the problems with what happened in 2019. We don't know what's going to happen. And we it, and hopefully something that I will get across to you by the end of biochemistry is that the systems we learn in class are extremely more complex in reality. Like we are just scratching the surface of complexity. Like I'm showing you the basics of the basics and anything we learn about, we, we are kind of just skipping that it's interconnected with everything else in the cell. Um, so when you're modifying like DNA, you might accidentally change something that you didn't want to change. So we don't know the long-term effects that could have on the human population. We need to do further research in other areas. We're jumping into human species. Sounds like we were trying to play God mostly. Gar regardless, mutations will happen by itself slowly, but surely. Yeah, I mean, naturally um, mutations do change. And I will also say that um, there is a way, I mean, it, it's, it's not great. You can do, you can make sure if you want to have a baby, um, and it's kind of gross to do this when you think about it, but I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't put my own ethics on it, but there is a way that if you want, you can get your DNA profile of your baby before it's born and you can have a good approximation of what, what's the eye color going to be, or what kind, what's this DNA going to be. Um, and if you wanted to, you could modify that. I'm not saying uh, that you should, but you could. Um, with plants, it seems for the most part, the scientific communities, from what we've learned about plants and other organisms, scientific community seems more on board with that. There's also some questions about there, especially when you um, introduce it into the wild. But at least in the lab, we use GMOs all the time. They were doing that in Europe for people who had money. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the truth of those reports because I heard something like that in like, I want to say California. So it could have just been internet gossip. So I'm not going to put much stock into it unless I really research it, but that is something that could happen. Um, so that's that's just some good, good discussion. It's always, it's a shame that in our curriculum, we have to make it so jam packed that we don't have a bioethics class where we can really discuss and dive into these topics, which I think um, for anyone who wants to do like science or medicine, uh, bioethics should be a huge component of that. Well, we don't have that right now. So good to see people sharing their viewpoints on that. Um, yeah, like I said, there's, there's no right answer to this. But anyways, let's move on to uh, GMOs in the lab, something that I think we're all mostly okay with doing it on a single celled organism. So back to the topic at hand. Let's say I want to study a protein. The, pro, the, the organism I'm going to use to grow my protein to study it is usually going to be our friend E. coli. The reason for this is that E. coli is well studied. We know how E. coli works um, very well. E. coli is also cheap to use. Um, you can buy a like vial of E. coli um, on the internet for like $80 and it'll come to you frozen. And once you have one vial, as long as you know what you're doing, you have an infinite amount of E. coli because you can keep making them reproduce and, re and refreeze them. Um, another organism that is typically used is yeast. Um, but for the most part, you're going to see people with E. coli. And what, what the whole process is, is we take our vector that we just talked about. Our, our, so whenever I say vector or plasmid, I mean the same thing, plasmid. I use those words interchangeably. A vector is a plasmid. You use restriction enzymes to make a cut in your plasmid. And you have DNA you want to insert. You use the same restriction enzymes to make cut in the DNA. You have perfect overlapping sticky ends 
you kind of put these together in the same test tube and then using a ligase, you join those together. Then you put these in the E. coli and you see, you know, is my protein growing? So like I said, we use E. coli all the time to study like human proteins. We will grow those in E. coli for, um, and, and harvest them. Does anyone know of any potential problems about growing eukaryotic proteins inside of a prokaryotic system? Does anyone know about what the differences could be of those two systems? Anyone take molecular cell biology or remember their biology classes? What's the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes? Can I repeat the question? Sure, as my dogs go wild. If I want to grow a eukaryotic protein in a prokaryotic system, what potential problems are there? Or what is the difference between eukaryotic proteins and prokaryotic proteins, if, if you've learned that in your previous classes? Eukaryotic mRNA re requires processing. Correct. Eukaryotes. Uh, we have things called introns and exons that we have to chop up. Prokaryotes do not. So when you put this DNA into E. coli, you have to make sure it's already processed. That is no chopping required because what the E. coli is gonna do is just read that DNA, start to finish and make an uh, RNA and not modify that RNA. So you have to make sure that the DNA has the sequence that you want. So, yep, processing is a big thing. What else do we have to consider? Well, here's one, modifications of amino acids. AA means amino acids. So sometimes when we make a protein, we can only create, you know, we only have sequences for 20 proteins, right? Or sorry, 20 amino acids. However, Sometimes we need to modify an amino acid so that it will um, do something a little bit different. And humans have roughly 700, I want to say, uh, amino acid modifications that they can make. Um, prokaryotes don't have that many. So if you want to grow a protein that has like a, a special amino acid in it that's only created after the protein has been created, you really can't do that in a prokaryotic system. You're not gonna do modifications. And this also includes post-translational modifications. That's basically what I'm talking about when I say modifications. Another big one in uh, eukaryotes, sugars. A uh, vast majority of eukaryotic proteins have sugars attached to them. And this happens after the protein has been created. Prokaryotic proteins don't get sugars on them. They don't get these glycosylations. That's what it's called, glycosylations. So when growing um, eukaryotic proteins in prokaryotic cells, you have to be aware you're not getting a one-to-one -one replication if it's supposed to have sugars on it or any uh, amino acid modifications.
right? So that's that's basically what I have for A. For B, and I'm gonna move it along here, uh, just so we don't fall too, fall too far behind. So if I'm trying to put foreign DNA into my plasmid, and I have a restriction endonuclease that makes blunt ends, what is the problem? Well, the problem is, there's two problems. The first problem is that it could go in backwards. So if you look at the picture in the middle picture, right? The way that this is supposed to work is that blue is supposed to go here. I believe that's how it's supposed to go anyways. Blue goes here and green goes here, the DNA and the foreign DNA. And now you have a complete plasmid. However, if it's blunt, you lose directionality. You don't have any overhand, overhangs, sorry, no overhangs to direct which way your DNA should go in. So what could happen is that it would insert backwards or green could go in there and blue could be on the top, set the other way around. So you would have a protein that is 180 degrees flipped in the DNA, which would not make a good, pro it would not make your protein. Directionality counts in DNA. So it could be inserted backwards. Or not inserted at all. So the way that this works, the reason why we can cut DNA and put it into a plasmid is because of these overhangs for the most part. Remember, these are bases that are sticking out into water. They want to hydrogen bond with other bases. And so the form, formation of these hydrogen bonds, that's gonna be driving your foreign DNA inserting into your plasma DNA. If you have a blunt end, remember blunt end doesn't have any overhang, uh, there's no compelling reason why your foreign DNA should go and interact with the plasma. So what you actually see when you do experiments of this is that if you create a blunt end DNA, insertion into a plasma is much, much lower than if you created a sticky end cut. So blunt ends are worse. You want to avoid blunt ends if you can. And finally, the uh, enzyme that we'll be looking at quite a bit in this class, um, and if you take biochem too, we actually talk about a lot there, is called a ligase. So we'll talk about enzymes in about, I don't know, a month from now and talk about the different classes. But for right now, anytime you see the word ligase, that means you're connecting things together. Right. Connecting. So DNA ligase connects DNA together. All right, so is there any questions about the information that's presented on this slide or any clarifications people, uh, people might want? All right, so we can move on then. So we've talked about inserting foreign DNA into a plasmid. The question is, where do you get this DNA from? Um, one way you can get this DNA is from like a real like live source. Um, so let's say I wanna study a human protein. Um, maybe I get a human tissue sample and get the DNA from that. Um, that's one way to do it. Another way, which is a much more convenient way, is called a DNA library. So what a DNA library is, is that it's a collection of every single genomic sequence from a single organism. And these are like 
actual physical things. It's not like an internet database that you look up. You can like go on the internet and type in like mouse DNA library and you can order any mouse DNA sequence you want sent to your house. So um, around the world, there are just freezers of DNA for every single sequence in like bacteria or yeast or mice or humans or flies or and like any model organism you could think of, you can buy any DNA sequence you want. Um, basically the way these are created is that you take genomic DNA and you just randomly cut it through a shotgun approach and you just replicate it and freeze it and you're good to go. So that's a DNA library. Um, a C DNA library is a little bit different. And I know it's cut off down here, but this says, so the bottom part says C DNA, DNA of genes from introns. Oh, sorry, from exons. So what a C DNA library is, or the C stands for complementary, is that instead of just taking the whole genome and making a library out of that, because we already learned today, most of our genome doesn't actually encode for proteins. So it doesn't make much sense to always have like everything. What you do in a cDNA library is that you take mRNA and you isolate that mRNA. Then you use a reverse transcriptase. So reverse transcriptase, you make DNA out of that mRNA. So by doing that, we can create a library of just proteins. So that question I have there for A, what's bigger? Or if you compare the size between a genomic library and the cDNA library, uh, would you expect them to be the same size or different? Um, so, well, based on what I just said, do you think a genomic library is the same size or different? Anybody, feel free to answer. Why aren't you paying attention in the last five minutes? Do you think genomic library and CDN library are the same size or different? Nobody knows. All right, since you all are being shy, or maybe you just weren't listening to me as I was babbling on, that's also very possible. I do like the drone on sometimes. Uh, they are different, quite different because the genomic contains all DNA of an organism. cDNA is just uh, the mRNA of that organism transferred in the DNA. And then B, going along those, that idea of what a cDNA is, cDNA library, do you think it from different cell types is be the same or different? Well, it's different, right? Each cell in a different tissue makes different mRNAs because it wouldn't make sense if a heart cell and a brain cell had the same proteins in it at the same amounts. Um, they need to be different. And so you would expect that different tissues make different cDNA libraries. And you can see that when you look at cDNA libraries, you can see that they can be tissue specific as well, not just organism specific. All right, so is there any questions about libraries, DNA libraries? Uh, 
Okay, so with that, that's actually the end of um, time for today. So what I'll do is I'll put up a homework, like I always do, um, based on what we talked about. Um, and then on Friday, we'll continue this lecture and move on to Friday's lecture. So uh, thank you for joining everybody. Hope you learned something new today. And I will see you on Friday, hopefully. Take care.